Okay, welcome to Lecture 5. Um, what we're going to do is talk primarily today about uh, things that are commonplace in, uh, in ninth grade physical science, and that's the ideas of solutions, compounds, mixtures, and this all fits very, very nicely into material structure, and I'm hopefully we'll give you a basis for giving your students a way of looking at this that really excites them, makes sense and uh, hooks to the bigger world that's through material structure. Before we do that, what I want to do is uh, go back and talk a little bit about what we did last time. Um, if you kind of synthesize the last couple lectures, something we did is we talked about material structure, uh, or material properties re really, um, maybe with your IA properties. Um, and uh, that's uh, shown here, material properties, mechanical properties, we talk about is stress versus strain. And the key properties we really care about here, one is the elastic stiffness. We often call that E, Young's modulus. And here's um, the, the place where you lose that, where you start going from elastic to plastic. And this is called the, 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 the strength, the yield strength there. And... Uh, what happens is we can see that this elastic deformation is by bond stretching, that's elastic, that's reversible, stores energy, and then, um, and then we get this part that gives you a permanent offset. That's a plastic strain, and uh, that, that's different. That's by atoms changing neighbors. Okay, so what we can do is that's a material property, but we almost never use materials in these very simple shapes we talked about where we just basically have like a wire or something like that and pull it in uniaxial tension. Always, as engineers, what we end up doing is making interesting shapes out of materials, and it's the shape plus the properties of the materials that really give you interesting devices, and that's kind of the whole, you know, what, what about half of mechanical engineering is all about, is what kind of shape do you want, and we, you know, material property, material scientists, do the materials. So the shape we considered, one we can make easily, is just a spring, like that, and springs we use to store energy, and these are far more compliant. We can use much smaller forces to get much larger strains than we can out of just something like this. That's also why they make something that we can use easily in a classroom. So um, the exercise we talked about before was basically imposing different displacements. And then you've got force on this axis, and we can easily have your students plot force versus displacement. If you've got something like a uh, elastic behavior, that's a fish scale, and eventually your material would bend over and do something like that. If you unload, it might come back with a, a different trajectory because you've changed the shape. But this is basically your spring constant, K. This is basically the strength of the spring it measured and force units. And this, if you think it through, this would be the work that you could store in that thing is basically the integral. And I, I don't think you're going to go that far in ninth grade, but, uh, but you, you could. And um, so the important thing here is you're really doing the same thing, but the, the, the shape of the spring is modifying the material behavior to get you um, to, to get you something else, to get you the, the spring constant and, and, and the strength of the spring. So the spring constant, remember, uh, K that we see there, K is equal to the change in force divided by the change in displacement. And that's your spring constant. And that's a slope that matters, and you can go and buy springs of different spring constants. That's something that people actually care about. Um, so last time I asked you guys uh, for a quiz and uh, got a lot of good intuition on it. Um, actually, a lot of wrong answers, though, because they, they were almost all trick questions. But the, the beauty of all of these questions is I think the right answer is far less important than there is a nice scientific method that you can use to pose these things and actually work these out, and that's partly why I did this. So, so first of all, Question A, how does doubling the spring length with everything else constant affect the spring constant? So what you could do is imagine in part A I've got a spring, and say this is L1, I'm going to pull on it, 
and this is force, this is displacement, and write displacement out. So you got something that looks like that, say, and then you've got a, a spring constant on it like that. Um, that's K, change in force divided by change in displacement. Now what I'm going to do is say, I'm going to take two of these springs, make it the same, and I'm going to make it just twice as long, so it looks like that. So basically, the same force is going to go through both of these springs, and i got L2 on top of L1, so L1 is going to stretch the same amount. L2 is also going to stretch the same amount, which is the same as L1. You've got it twice as long. So at the same force, you're going to have twice the displacement. So the spring constant, K, is equal change in force by my change in displacement. This is 1 over 2, or is half, half as big as it was before. You've got twice the displacement at the same force. So doubling the spring length will make K k nu is equal k old divided by 2. You've made the spring constant half is, law, is large. And again, that's a question you could ask your class. Have them test it and have them learn something. Very simple like that. Um, I'm just going to erase that to make some room. So let's consider part B. So what you could do with B is how would softening the steel affect everything else? So what you could do with this is you could make out of your hard stainless steel, make a spring, and then measure the properties of that spring. And you could do it basically like this, um, where what you do is force displacement, or you could easily do it the other way around, but, but you could imagine displacement is your controlled variable, and I, I shouldn't use these old Greek characters, this is too much. Um, force displacement, so um, what we do is we get something for the, the hardened stainless steel. It'll look something like this. We get the spring constant, and then also we get the strength like that. So this is with hard hardened steel. Okay. So now how do you anneal that? Well, what I can easily do and is just basically, and, and this is something your, your kids would love, uh, go get yourself a butane torch, propane torch. Um, depends on the material you're, you're using, but for stainless steel, if you have a uh, propane torch, you'll do a, a great job of it. Heat the thing up, and uh, and then and then basically take that. So you got this thing. Flame comes out, heats it up, and then you can test it again. And and it, ideally, you want one that you haven't haven't deformed through here. And when you do that, what you'll actually find to what will probably be your surprise is the, the, the spring constant K is going to be just about the same, but it's going to be much weaker. It's, going to, it's not going to be able to carry as much load. So this is the, what the annealed... Because the reason for this is the annealing doesn't actually change the elastic stiffness of the steel, but it does end up changing the strength. So it can't carry as much load, but it should have the same spring constant. So um, so the answer to this is no, it won't change the spring constant, but it changes or actually reduces strength. Does annealing steel affect the failure yod? Yes, and again you can test this. And how does doubling the wire diameter affect the spring constant, all else constant? And this again should make K larger. It should take more force to get the same displacement. Okay, so again, those are I think good questions, and that these are all things that you can go into your classroom test. And the answers, as you probably found, ain't obvious. So um, hopefully, some of you go up and do that. Okay, so let, let's. Uh, move on from springs to the next topic and the next topic we're going to talk about is structure of matter and this really goes into kind of atoms of periodic table there's some chemical bonding and chemical reactions but the main thing we're really going to talk about here is classification of matter that's where this is and this is in the you know, new, newer standards as well as the old standards and actually the new standards 
ask for ways you can uh, look at this experimentally. It also asks if you can show ways that you can change the properties of a material without changing the chemistry and there's actually ways you can do this. So um, this asks you about composition of matter, pure substances, mixtures, physical and chemical properties. This is where we are all over this and what we're going to do today I hope. And then on, on top of it uh, I, I believe the difference between science and a lot of other things is we do science with math, not adjectives. We like numbers. Numbers make it predictive. And so along those lines, again, we're going to get into logarithms a little bit and talk about logarithmic scales and, and uh, hammer that point again. And hopefully uh, by the end of, the, of this term, you'll, you'll, you'll see the value in all of that. So here's what we're, our focus objectives are going to be. We're going to talk about how matter is composed. That's something we've talked a little bit about before, and we'll talk again about, about polymers, ceramics, metals, composites. Um, pure substances are really elements. You could also take pure, uh, pure compounds. For example, you could say pure, pure water, for example. It depends on your frame of reference, although it is a um, compound, of course. Um, Solutions are where you've got things intimately mixed, uh, intimately, I don't, I don't know how to spell it, I'm, not, I'm just going to say uh, mixed at the atom scale. Mixtures are mixed at a, at a coarser scale. Compounds, you have chemical reactions, and then uh, physical and chemical properties. We're not going to talk about too much today, but again, we've got some good examples that we'll be hitting. Again, thermal conductivity being a good one. Electrical conductivity is something we can measure, and we'll be coming back to um, stiffness, strength. These are all properties that we can measure. Density is another one. And then we're also going to bring up the idea of phases, and phases are basically uh, areas, you know, basically uh, regions, matter, that are homogeneous, meaning the properties don't change place to place, and distinct via properties. And you'll see what I mean by that. And through that, what we're going to do is show you what material structure really looks like, the stuff that we use all the day, all the time. So, so the objectives here, we want to say, what, what do we mean when we talk about material structure? Um, what, how does, and, and material structure we care about is really all at the micro scale, so we talk about microstructure. How do microstructure terms relate to those terms that we care about in physical science? We'll bring it back to that. Um, talk about key features, talk about how we examine microstructures, look at what they look like, and we're going to talk about typical sizes, and the sizes are actually mind-bending because things happen all at all kinds of very, very different length scales. There's a lot of action at length scales that we cannot see with our naked eye. We can't even see with the, a very strong optical microscope. So you need stronger tools, and that is somewhat mind-bending to understand what size those are, but I think it's possibly good for your students. Then we'll talk about what we mean by the term phase. Okay, so, so let's imagine I've got two things. And imagine I've got a bunch of A. I'll imagine A is this color. And that's my A. And I'm going to add element B to it. Imagine A and B are both elements. A and B could be different compounds as well if you like, but we'll just assume they're different elements. And then I've got, oops, didn't change my color. And there's B. It's going to look like that. So, so, so what I could do is I could take, take A and add B to it. And what are the things that could happen? Well, I could add B to it, and the B just sits on top and what would that be? In that case that would be B would be a pure element, A would be a pure element, those are just basically two pure elements that, 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 that fit together. 
I could also make it so that I've got B and maybe there's some more B down here. Another little region of B here, some A over there. And I could have uh, A and B are mixed, but not really dissolved in one another. Just got little chunks of A, little chunks of B. This would be a mixture. So my, my options are pure compound. Two of them, A and B mixed, uh, which would be a mixture. Or the other thing that could happen, going back into this, is every now and then I could have a B in here and this would be a solution like that. Or the last thing that could happen is I could get an ordered array erasers have trouble with some of these um, or I could have an ordered array where, where maybe I've got a B in every one of these sites here like this so I could also form a compound. So all of these ideas of um, I should say pure elements up here. So all of these things that we typically think about we can have pure elements, we can have mixtures, we can have solutions, we can have compounds. All of this can happen not just in the gaseous or or liquid state, but we can have all this happen at the solid state. And this is really indeed the way materials are made. The, all, all of, we use all of these tricks to make materials that we care about and have particular properties. Okay? So really the material science gives a great great uh, basis for that part of the part of your physical science curriculum. So, um, again, you can get elements, compounds, solutions, mixtures. All these things are possible. Manipulation of that is really the key to what material science is. And in this, uh, the next few minutes here, I want to give you an introduction to that through what is really the core of material science, which is microstructure. So here is microstructure. And... This is, um, th these are examples we'll go through in a little bit and take a, a bit at a time. Um, first of all, uh, if we deal with metals, simple metals, aluminum, copper, zinc, um, steel, uh, titanium, all these things that, that make up the structural world that we, um, that, that we inhabit, they're almost always crystalline. And by crystalline, what we mean is they, that the atoms have very distinct lattice positions that, that go into 3D. It's like boxes of cornflakes that are all all uh, uh, one on top of the other going in an XYZ grid. So what this is, is this is what a common material looks like. This is um, a bunch of crystals. This one might have characteristic orientations going one way. Next one has characteristic orientations going another way. And these crystals are all separated by grain boundaries and this thing has been prepared in such a way that each crystal takes on a different color. And that's what a material looks like at, at a length scale. And this is 400 microns, so uh, one millimeter is a thousand microns, so this would be about a millimeter, It'd be about that long. Um, you know what a millimeter looks like, that's something you can see. So these grains are, are things you need a microscope to see, but they're, they're, they're seeable. Um, this is an example. This, this, in this case, this is 200 nanometers. A uh, thousand nanometers makes up a millimeter, so this is uh, a much, much, much smaller yet. And this is an example of um, a compound. This compound is Ni3Al. Which is in a matrix, a solid solution matrix of nickel plus some other things dissolved and this is in a cubic or face center cubic structure there and then these things are line defects called dislocations which are working around it. This is the workhorse material for very high temperature materials in, um, in, in aircraft engines, nickel based super alloys. And what they look like is sort of like this. We've got this region here which is a solid solution of nickel plus some other stuff. And then you have a region here 
And this is a compound. And that compound might be this Ni3Al. Okay, so this is very much what, what materials often look like. We have these mixtures of regions that are solutions and compounds all stuck together in the solid state. And then we also have other defects. These are grain boundaries. These, so the idea here is these might be grains. These are the areas where the materials are, are very ordered. And then between these ordered regions, we have some disordered regions. These are called grain boundaries, and we'll get to that. Now, over the one-hour lecture, I'm not going to make you an expert on what microstructure is, but I hope I can give you some idea that the, the solids... Uh, that, that rather elements, solutions, compounds, crystals, all these things act in a very complicated way down at this length scale. And uh, it's a good motivating example and I think a good sense of wonder about, boy, what, what do things really look like down there? Because it is, it is actually fairly amazing. Um, the other thing, just to kind of get your head around this, um, there, there's some absolutely fantastic stuff that's been done over the years that kind of gets you around uh, what length scales look like. And again, this is scale and powers of 10, which is you know, basically log logarithmic scales. And uh, this is a, uh, th there's a classic that was done by IBM 1977 that's shown here. They start out at Burnham Harbor in Chicago and uh, start out at a picnic and zoom way out to show what the universe looks like and zoom way in to uh, what subatomic particles look like, all the time saying we're changing our field of reference by 10 times bigger, 10 times bigger, or 10 times smaller, 10 times smaller, and uh, gives you an idea of this vastness. This is all done on logarithmic scales, but done uh, with adjectives. Morgan Freeman did a um, uh, slicker version for a PBS show that's on there, and uh, of course uh, there's a Simpsons version of this also, which is, is good for comic relief, and like most things on The Simpsons, actually fairly, fairly thought-provoking. Um, all, all highly recommended stuff and what this gets to is this idea of length scales, logarithmic scales and um, again I think you all know how the metric system works we're for length, our primary thing is a meter and then we have all these prefixes where k is equal to a thousand um, m is usually equal to point one one thousand, the micron, or a mu symbol, symbol, ten to the minus six, and then ten to the minus nine, pico, minus twelve, and, and, and so forth. Um, so here, here's here's a here's a length scale. This is um, start with a meter here, and this is you know human height is about two meters. A logarithmic scale that sits right there. And if we go for materials, we usually care about going smaller. So you go from human height, human hand, to human fi fingernail size. Um, a, 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 your, the thickness of your door panel on your car is about a millimeter thick, 10 to the minus 3. And, and all these E's, this would be 10 to the minus 3. And then within that thickness of the door, there's actually many, many grains that go across that. So, you know, a, a beverage can is much thicker. Uh, crystal diameter for these metals is usually on the order of about uh, 10 microns or so, or 30 microns or so. Um, it's right around the smallest things you can see with your, your naked eye. And um, you know, to go smaller, you get to about a micron talk about microns a lot in material science. That's getting close to the wavelength of visible light. You can't see anything even with an optical microscope that's much smaller than a micron. Therefore you can't really see bacteria very well with an optical microscope. And there's all kinds of things that happen in materials that are much smaller than that. We see little uh, compounds basically that make little compounds that are well dispersed within aluminum are what make aluminum very strong and allow airplanes to fly. And it's these strengthening clusters which are little compounds about a, a thousand atoms across. Um, you should know that an atom diameter is about 2.5 angstroms. An angstrom isn't quite a SI unit. What we like is a nanometer. So that's about 0. Point, or it is exactly 0. 0.25 
nanometers, and that'd be about what an atomic repeat distance is in metals, polymers, and glasses down there. So again, you keep going backwards, and if you go through those powers of 10, you know, you can see they're going really, really, really small by, by, by compounding this way. And I think if you want to get into math, and I, I know that uh, this is probably a little forbidding, you could ask questions about how many atoms thick is your finger, or something like that, come up with some orders of magnitude on that. And if you see, you're going from here to here, let's see, a width of a fingernail, it's about 10, 100,000, 10,000, 100,000, million, 10 million, 100 million, so about, about, you know, 10 to the 8 atoms is the distance across your finger, so, you know, <laughs> much, much different, so um, 100 million atoms just across uh, is, is about the, the, the size of your finger, so, you know, re things get, get really, really, um, difficult to, to conceptualize, and that is part of what makes material science interesting and so forth. So anyway, that, that's your length scales. I'm going to use this as a bit of a road map. It's not essential, but if, if it's useful to you, I, I'd like to, to, to keep this with you. So again, key length scales are an angstrom is down here, nanometer is 10 times bigger, atoms sit in about here, And then if we've got little compounds that we make on purpose, they're usually somewhere in here. The size of the crystals we have in structural materials are usually a few microns. X, X tells XTALS is way out from abbreviated crystals. And then the stuff we build is, is way out here. So, you know, big, big disparities in orders of magnitude and size, again, makes things interesting yet sometimes difficult. Okay, let's continue on. So, again, uh, just going back to this, uh, this is an example I, I kind of started with. If you've got something like an airplane, big length scales, it's got an engine, the engine has a hot zone. The hot zone, basically, the that you have got a jet that's at high speed that's going past these turbine blades, which is causing this rotor to to move. The heart of that is a very highly engineered turbine blade that has a ceramic coating. It's got cooling passages. It's got a highly highly engineered material that is a single crystal, but it's a single crystal that has this bricks and mortar structure of these compounds of Ni3Al with nickel around them. Um, and this is very strong at high temperature, and that's what makes, this is one of the things that makes affordable aviation uh, possible, is, is that these materials that make up these crystal, crystal blades. Um, and uh, it's getting higher and higher tech all the time. So again, key vocabulary you should have already, is, is we're getting to, but I'm going to be a little more specific about, is a grain, is basically a crystal. A phase we'll get to. So a phase is the idea of you've got back here two different phases. This phase is a, these compounds, this Ni3Al. There's another phase which is chemically distinct that goes around it, which is a solid solution of nickel. So phases are areas that are chemically distinct. Solute. Even in solids, you can have nickel with, for example, chrome or copper or, or something else in it, and that could be dissolved. So you've got uh, one thing inside the other. Crystalline means you have this, this ordered structure. Crystalline amorphous we'll get to, and we'll review these as we get later towards the end. So here's um, a distinction I want to make is, is, is glasses are, um, or as I said, most things are crystalline. They have these ordered structures. And if you take SiO2, has this structure of these silicon oxygen tetrahedra. If you've got it, if you've got SiO2, cool it relatively slowly, you'll get this crystalline phase called quartz. And it has this highly ordered structure that just repeats like this, on and on and on and on. If you either cool it fast or add some impurities to it, they frustrate the formation of this, and they give you what we call a glassy or amorphous structure. It means the same thing. And it basically means that you do not have 
long range order. This is another structure materials can have. And you could have a glassy phase, for example, an area that doesn't have um, long range order with crystalline phases around it. Um, so the important thing about glass is glass, you're basically freezing in a liquid-like structure. This is sort of what the structure of a liquid would look like, you don't, where you don't have this, this, this really strong long-range order. So if you take something that, that's really liquid and you cool it, if you get a glassy phase, you don't see a distinct change in volume. You just go and, and, and you see a, a, a change in this curve of volume versus temperature. Whereas if you actually form a, a solid out of it and crystallize it, you go from a liquid volume to a crystalline volume. And in the, in the case of, of water, you know that ice takes up a greater volume than water. That's unusual. Most of the time, the solid takes up a smaller volume. And you see this, this discontinuity, which isn't there in glass. And I don't want to make a very big deal of that. Uh, later on, we'll talk about using... Uh, viscosity to do processing of glass because we can make it uh, viscous, but that's going to that's going to come back later. And hopefully, I know I'm going a little bit fast, but hopefully, uh, some of what you've seen in materials camp, this is uh, 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 this is complementing. So again, just to hit, make the point one more time, this here would be a glassiomorphous structure, and then this here would be a crystalline structure. And I've included this slide as much as anything. Just uh, if, you, if you need more visuals, this is more visuals you possibly could use with your class. Um, the, and glass systems are, are really single phase, and that's partly why we can see through them. If you had other particles or other mixtures in there that would scatter light, and that wouldn't give you good optical clarity. So again, the structure gives the properties and uh, again that's uh, the way we the way we roll that's uh, controlling controlling material structure to give you the properties you need that's what material science is is all about um, so again just going back to the same example hitting it one more time this is um, a nickel based super alloy what goes into an airplane um, this is the this mortar within this structure that holds these little compound regions together. This is basically nickel. It's face center cubic, has a certain uh, melting point. And, and again, every now and then one of these may not be nickel. They may be aluminum or something else. So it's really a solid solution, which is highly engineered. And then inside of this, you've got these, these other uh, compounds, gamma prime, Ni3Al. They're a chemically ordered structure. And they all fit together like this. And uh, just to give you an idea of the length scales, you know, in this case, this is about 200 nanometers. 100, 1,000 nanometers equals one micron. 1,000 microns is equal to one millimeter. 1,000 millimeters is equal one. Meter. So you know th this is tiny, 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 and uh, and the atoms within that, um, you could ask yourself how many atoms across is that? An atom is about uh, about four atoms per per micron, uh, four atoms per nanometer rather. So that's about on the order of 800 atoms across, 800 repeat distances. So that's what we have, and and this is something that you need an electron microscope. To see, so this is the way matter fits together. Atoms make these, and, and then they fit together, and so forth. And you can see that this is really, um, well, what, what is this? T take a second to think about what this is. It's really um, a mixture where you've got two phases, a compound and a solid solution sitting together, and then this one itself is actually a solution and we don't want pure elements sitting around because they're not very strong. So again, that's what we, we end up doing. Okay, so, so again, um, kind of going back, we, we've got single crystals versus polycrystals. This is sort of what our single crystal looks like. Again, if you take a piece of aluminum, it's made at the local scale like that, but each of these crystals are very strong, small. They all fit together in a manner like this. This might be 
30 microns across, fairly fine grains, and this is what the structure ends up looking like. And these crystals can have different properties in different directions. Um, don't, let's not worry about this right now. It's a little, little advanced. So those crystals, we can either get them so there's some overall orientation. We can do that by rolling. We can get the, the, the sizes and orientations to take on a texture. Or we can have just random orientation within that. But again, within each of these regions, these are all single crystals. And these single crystals are separated by boundaries. So single crystal is, is actually fairly rare. I'll give you a second to think about what a single crystal might be. And there's only three examples that I can think of that are common. One is the gemstone, like if you wear a diamond ring or a cubic zirconia crystal, that, that's basically a single crystal. Another single crystal is the jet engine, engine blades we talked about. That's a highly engineered single crystal we use. The third one is, if you know anything about the history of integrated circuits and, um, uh, and, and the actual application, these, these are all based on silicon single crystals. And we grow huge silicon single crystals on the order of two feet in diameter and several feet long. And these are cut into wafers. Those wafers are then patterned. And that ends, that, that's what powers our computers. And uh, it all starts with single crystals. Single crystals are hard to make. Most of the time we deal with polycrystals. So your car is, with the exception of the integrated circuits within it, is all made up of polycrystalline uh, steel mostly, some aluminum, some magnesium maybe, some copper for sure. And they look like this where you've got little crystals separated by grain boundaries. Okay. So the way we look at this is we do this so we can look at this with optical microscopy and we are going to try to develop a lab you can deploy in your classroom where uh, we can use a, a lab microscope that might be 100x where we can polish this surface at about 600 grit paper, put a little bit of acid on it, bring out the structure, and this is something you should actually be able to, to do in a ninth grade classroom. I've never seen this done before. Um, we're going to work this out. If anybody wants to be a, a guinea pig for this, uh, we're more than more than happy to try to set you up to see if this works within your classroom environment. And that's the way it's done. Again, you can read about it, um, but uh, hopefully we'll, we'll be doing this in at least some of your classrooms. And these are the sort of results. This is a cast structure, I can tell you. And the, this art of, do, of polishing and looking with a microscope, it's called metallography. There's some great references should be, you'd be interested in this. And there's also some great micrographs available online. And you may want to use these when you talk about our things, mixtures, solutions, um, compounds, etc. So, as I said, the problem comes in that light has, has a wavelength of about one micron, and there's a whole lot of action in material science below one micron. So you can't see that with optical light. You can't see things that are much smaller than the wavelength of light. But electron microscopy, you can do that. You can basically accelerate electrons. They have a much, much shorter wavelength. We can do imaging, we can do diffraction to understand crystal structure, we can get out chemical signatures by bombarding things and looking at the x-rays they admit. We can't do justice, but I've already used several electron micro micrographs to show things off. Um, x-ray diffraction is another thing if you're getting into physics. We could talk about linking material science into uh, physics through x-ray diffraction. I'm not going to spend any more time on that right now. But through that, we can understand that these are the sort of basic crystal structures that go into things. Um, this is sodium chloride, the rock salt structure. Again, you know, kind of a nice compound. Um, that's a, th these are the same, different, different uh, representations of the same thing. This is another compound called the zinc blend structure. It's a somewhat different structure that gives you that. And then this is the structure of graphite. And graphite is basically these very tightly covalently bonded planes, which can be very, very strong. That's why graphite fiber is so strong. But these planes are held together by weak secondary or van der Waals bonds. 
And as a result of that, if you put graphite in a pencil, you can get these layers to slough off one another. So you can have it be very strong in the right orientation or very weak in the other. And again, all the action here, you're seeing this at, you know, at the several nanometers level, whereas, again, engineering stuff is way out, way out here. Okay. So um, what's really interesting, and this is one of the things that comes up very directly in ninth grade science standards, is how you can manipulate the structure of something, a fixed chemistry, to give you very different properties. And the way we do this in, in industrial practice is by cast and wrought structures. So if I take a, a copper nickel alloy and solidify it, it turns out what's going to happen is a nickel wants to solidify more and so it's going to solidify first and reject the copper and you'll see these dendrites. This is a lot like what you see in the winter when you put the wiper fluid on your window and it makes these um, uh, little dendritic structures, these little tree like structures and it pushes out the stuff that doesn't want to freeze quite as much. So the uh, nickel freezes, kind of pushes out the copper but these things are basically soluble in one another so if you heat it back up and roll it and rot turns out is just the past form of work. It's sort of a word that's gone out of out of use, but it just means it's been worked, which means we've taken this material, rolled it, give it some heat into it. If you take the same thing, you can make you can make it look like that where the composition is homogeneous and you've got nice um, regular equiaxed grains. This is chemically the same stuff. But you'll get different properties. In particular, this will probably have better ductility, better better thermal conductivity, better electrical conductivity, um, and it's just recrystallized and allowed diffusion to, to 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 bring those two materials together. So, again, depending on the process it goes on, you get very different structures. This is an example. Um, this is another example where you've got a weldment, and during in weldments, you see all kinds of different structure depending on where you're at. And if we can figure out how to do some cheap metallography within your classroom, weldment, weldments are great things to look at. You see all kinds of structure all over the place. And, uh, you know, this is out here in, in this kind of ballpark. All these you're looking at, you know, um, well in this case is 400 microns. So you're sitting up here about like that. And with this picture here of a weldment, you're sitting up here at a few millimeter scale. So here we're looking at the, the much higher part of the length scale. And again, grains and grain boundaries fit together. Here you're dealing in, uh, in the area of, you know, tens of microns or so. And that these are all, all the individual crystals fit together. And the way they fit together, as you can see, these atom planes, this is um, high resolution uh, imaging using a transmission electron microscope. You can see the grains fitting together and forming these defects where the grains come together. This is what we would call a grain boundary. Okay. And if we want to make something very strong, what we end up doing is putting these very small compounds into otherwise our crystalline lattice. And again, this is on the order of 200 nanometers. So um, here's a nanometer, 10 nanometers, 100 nanometers, so this would be down in that that kind of kind of level would be this like this 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 bar right there. So again, the idea lots of action at all kinds of length scales. Um, so here's microscopy in use. Here are some of the techniques we can do to to, to look at cracking effects. Um, this is some some work I was involved with to look at uh, cracking in um, in a particular super alloy. And uh, what you can see is, is cracking tends to happen along these crystalline boundaries. This is a crack path. We can actually image to see what crystal is where. And again, look at all kinds of different length scales associated with, with this. So let me bring this back. Hopefully, you know, you have an idea of at least now what we mean by a microstructure. You can relate those terms to things we care about in physical science. Key features are compounds, solutions, crystals, amorphous regions. Uh, we can examine the microstructures both by polishing and by uh, looking at them with electron microscopes and optical microscopes. Um, 
typical microstructures you've seen several and we've seen sizes and phases are these areas that have uniform properties and chemical composition. So again, let me just kind of bring this back to, to you know, the things we care about, elements, compounds, solutions, mixtures. Um, for example, here's, here's elements. This is if you take aluminum and silicon, and you can, they will uh, work together. In, uh, you can, they, one will dissolve in the other. And what happened to my, my pen, but that's not, usually not good. Um, one will dissolve in the other. And okay, I'm just going to talk. So, <laughs> so this is aluminum and silicon up on the upper right, and these blocks within that are silicon inside the aluminum, and basically they're they're reasonably pure one another, and they've divorced each other. They don't like to form compounds, and so you can see the two elements segregating to form sort of a mixture up there. So you've got mixtures of two elemental regions. And um, I'm just stopping because I uh, think my computer might be frozen. Um, and then uh, the other thing you see on the bottom is a nickel-based superalloy. Again, that's sort of a mixture of two, two regions, a compound and a solid solution. Um, the carbon steel you see down there, that's an example of iron. And then this other area within it that looks kind of dark and mottled, that's actually regions of iron plus iron carbide, Fe3C, that end up fitting together. Again, it's uh, basically a pure metal and a compound sitting next to one another. And then bottom right is really a classical mixture, is fiberglass, and those round things are just glass fibers held together in a plastic matrix, and it's just a classical mixture of things. And we'll see if I'm recording or if anything good is happening or not.